Network. It is episode 999. That is right, 999. We are here with a couple of guests. They're supposed, they're supposed to be five. We got two. But we will see who else joins. With that being said, my name is Keith Andrew, and welcome to the Keith Andrew Network. Today, we sit down with Rick and Fred. Rick, you've been on the show multiple times. Thank you for putting up with me. And Fred, this is your first time being on the show. I want to say thank you for joining us. So the first question I want to ask is to ask Fred, I'm going to start off with you, is tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. Okay. Uh, My title, Dr. Fred Waters. I'm a close quarter combat instructor. Uh, I'm a former world champion, contender for the 92 Olympics. I train military and close quarter combat. I specialize in disarming weapons. I train all type of people. Um, I do movies, act. I'm a fight choreographer. And um, I modeled. I do all the nice, fun things. I'm a retired trucker and Army veteran. Well, first off, thank you for your service. Oh, you're welcome. And you mentioned you were a former world heavyweight champion? World, a world champion in karate. Point fighting. I won the world championship in 1991. Well, and go ahead. You no, know, I was going to say a world champion is a world champion. So, I've had, uh, well, like I said, it's a, I'm thankful for your service. And it's a really great to have that accomplishment, being a world champion. Yeah, thank you. And I'm also a 10-time martial arts Hall of Famer. I forgot, just got, got my 10th Hall of Fame back in November. <laughs> No, oh, that's absolutely amazing. You're a true inspiration. Yeah, thank you. Now, let me ask you, what, what is it like to be a former world heavyweight champion? And, you know, I consider myself a former, uh, I have a wrestling belt, but I'm not a wrestler. But I consider myself a former world champion for fighting for people with disabilities and making a statement for 10 years. So mm-hmm. that's why I consider myself a champion. By all rights, you're better. You're a bigger and better champion than I am. So, what was it like winning the world title and being a ten-time Hall of Famer? Well, just winning it was a big deal for me because I'm a prof- I was a professional truck driver. I'm retired now. I drove tractor trailers for a living. So, my dream was to make it to the Olympics and uh, just getting out there fighting the people down in Ocean City, Maryland at the Coliseum and people from all over the world was there. So just a place would would have been a big opportunity for me, but taking first place was a bigger opportunity because then my sights were set on the Olympics for the 92 Olympics and being a truck driver working 12, 14 hours a day was rough. And I trained four hours on the weekends, Saturday and Sundays that's the only training I got. And it was hard training, being tired, but just the accomplishment to be around great martial artists was a blessing. And so we all have, we all are champions in whatever we do. Some people like you do for disabilities, you're a champion doing that. Some people in music, getting kids off of drugs, talking to people, underprivileged people, you know, everybody's a champion in their own way. But the only thing different about my championship, I got busted in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> pull the growing muscle <laughs> so you know it was fun I, I mean i never dreamed of ever winning anything like that my biggest dream when i was a kid was just getting a black belt that's as far as my mind could conceive when i was a young teenager buying black belt magazine you know you work sell papers cut somebody's grass you make a couple nickels a couple dimes and I go to the drugstore, the corner store, and get the magazine and look at all these famous guys. The next thing you know, I never made it to Black Belt Magazine, but I was in Karate International and Taekwondo Times. So that was a blessing just to walk in the path where famous people walked. And to where I've got now, you know, the blessing of training military people, training truckers, training women in, in uh, self-defense, training actors how to uh, fight on set. T- and, you know, right now, training people how to disarm weapons because it's getting crazy out here. So I'm having a blast. No, uh, where are you based? In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Never been there. I got all my things to do with. But 
you know, when you say it's getting worse, it can't be as bad as New York City because New York City's fr- a freaking cesspool right now. It's like a Mad Max movie. You have one story we heard was one guy was on a bus was a a machete yeah. on a, a number one had like uh, um, a flamethrower, and it's kind of like <laughs> where are the mental institutions? And where you need it. And this is one of my uh, favorite, I mean, sarcastic, by the way. One of my favorite things is someone who got arrested 37 times, but yet he's still walking the street. Yeah. It's kind of like, and I'm the one with a disability. (laughs) So, you know, it's kind of like the way you disconnect, you know, how bad is it in Pennsylvania? Well, it depends on where you go. It's I've been I've been in Europe. I was stationed in Europe, and I'm tell you what, it, wherever you go in this world, there's good places and bad places. You just can't be going into the bad places because you know it's things can happen. And now the, the like I tell people now, if you look at from here, this is the floor. Crime, well, good people are here. Crime is up here. <laughs> What you have to do is prepare yourself mentally and physically, and I call it the combat zone. I used to run New York a lot. I mean, I used to run, you know, drove Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens. Those are some of the runs I used to run to. And I, you know, cutting down there off of, uh, what's that street? Christie Street down there. I'm quite sure you heard about that street. So you, it's the way you interact with people. Like going through Harlem. I would park on the side of the street on Harlem, uh, on Amsterdam Avenue, I get out and talk on the phone. I didn't care about nobody. I mean, I'm not the baddest. I'm not that. I'm not like Bruce Lee and nothing like that. I can take care of myself now, but it's the confidence you have. You know, a person, criminals look for somebody that has a low self esteem. You know, I look a person right in the eye. Hey, what? You know, I speak to them nice, but come to get my money, you're going to get something a little bit more than that. I, I don't think I'm giving up as fists and feet. And knees, elbows, I'll bite the crap out of somebody if I take my money. <laughs> so it's just learn how to just, you know, just be yourself, but know where to go and where you shouldn't go. Now, with that said, a 10th degree black belt don't stop me from anything. You know, I can, somebody can always walk up and put a gun in the back of my head. Somebody can always bust me in the back of the head if I'm not paying attention. So being aware of your surroundings will what really helps you. So there's a lot. So take a self-defense course somewhere. Because don't, I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever let you make, don't ever think that because I got a disability, I can't do it. There's a lot of things you can do. It don't take much to grab hold of somebody, stick your thumb right in their eyeball. It don't take much for that. You see what I mean? No, you're absolutely right. And Rick, I didn't want to leave you out, but we're going to take a break in about seven minutes, but I'm going to give you the remaining time, then we can take the break. Hey, uh, I just saw that Jahari joined and since I've been on your dog podcast several times, I do not mind yielding to let Jahari, Jahari introduce herself and go with uh, anything she wants to talk about. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing? Uh, Hello, Mr. Uh, Andrew. Hey, Rick. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for the information. Now, I heard Mr. Waters talking. I, I'm going to hire him as my bodyguard one day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Next time I go to the city. <laughs> I understand. You know, I am from Brooklyn, New York, so I mm-hmm. get it. I get it. I have not been back in a minute, but every time I do go, it's like I'm a tourist. So, <laughs> like, wow, that wasn't there before. Oh, wh- what happened to this? So it's always exciting in New York, you know. So talk to me, gentlemen. What's your question? What do you What do you have for me? <laughs> well, the first one I'll ask, uh, but we can always go to the hard hitting after with words, but. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. I am Jahari. That's the name I like to use. It's the middle initial. And I have, I have been an actress since I came out the womb, so to speak. <laughs> the parents just didn't understand it. They was like, she has so much energy. I've always been performing from elementary school all the way up to, <clears throat> yeah, college. <laughs> <laughs> I almost told on myself. I don't even know how this lighting is, so please forgive oh, me if I, right. if I look too dark right. or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that pandemic weight. Oh, can't stand it. Can't stand it. But anywho, 
going back to me, um, since um, since elementary school, I've always been performing. The funny thing about it for me, I had to leave New York, where I'm born and raised, Brooklyn, New York, and come down, come all the way down to Maryland. And I started getting gigs in New York. <laughs> and I uh, met a whole plethora of people in Maryland that's from New York. And the energy, if you will, is electrifying. Not New York electrifying. It's always a difference, but it was impressive. And I learned a lot in Maryland. And I met Rick <laughs> at um, David E. Talbert's uh, workshop. Yep. Didn't know him. Didn't know him. And he, Mr. Talbert, had us do an assignment. And I, you know, did the church finger, ran to the ladies and came back. And I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And they said, we have to team up with people. And it was an Oh, a big Rick. Was it a big auditorium type of room? It was open space auditorium. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a lot of people there. And, you know, everybody ran to who they wanted to. And I saw Rick over there and I did a beeline straight to him. I said, <laughs> do you care to be my my teammate? He was like, no, not, a, not at all. And Rick has this energy about him that he has. I, I was I don't know to talk to him like his disposition was protective. But then he's a gentle soul. So it was like, we got to do this workshop together. It's like I snatched him up. Come on. Like, you know, the, the fly on the wall that want to dance. But um, he's afraid to ask the girl to dance. So the girl has to ask him to dance. That was the energy I got from Rick. And ever since then, Rick has just been like my big brother. I can call him. I can ask advice. We even did um, our homework assignment. I say that, you know, yeah. our assignment that Mr. Talbot gave us, we actually put it on YouTube. At YouTube, my, yeah. My wife, yeah, my, was it? Help me out. It was one of our... It's, it's, so, it's been so much. <laughs> we have done so much. And then Rick, oh my goodness. From and once we, we, when we met oh, then, I think that was almost 15 years ago, 15, yeah. 20? No, not yeah. 20. It was 15. 2013. It's been so much. <laughs> we have done so much and, and Rick, oh my goodness. From and once we, we when we met oh, then, I think that was almost 15 years ago, 15, yeah. 20. No, not yeah. 20. It was 15. 2013. Uh 12, 2012. Cause I really yeah, because he his movie uh almost Christmas came after yes. that a lot of people from that session to be in his movie oh okay so see he has a better memory than me so i met rick rick is a ball of energy i was telling him i was on a cruise the tom joiner cruise and a colleague of mine she said you're going on that cruise and you're going to audition for tyler perry i was like okay <laughs> it was a costly trip it was a beautiful vacation i did audition i got a call back but i didn't make the cut and some of the people that was on that same cruise i met there at um david e talbert's um workshop so long story i'm trying to make short it's a network like you're doing mr andrew it's you never know who you will run into you never know who's going to remember you from where um I, the most exciting thing was God bless the dead when my when my mother was alive. She was how do you say? She saw me do the work I kept talking about. I did things with BET. We do it was a um, for my man and it was always um, what is it called? What is it called? When you do a reenactment. You know, yeah. of a, a true story. Yeah. So my mother, I'm in, I, I went all the way home to Brooklyn, New York, and I'm in the house, you know, cooking, cleaning, whatever I had to do. And then I noticed the time and I ran to her bedroom. I said, Mom, turn on this channel, turn on the channel, turn on the TV to this channel. And she was like, well, okay, what's the problem? I said, just go ahead. I, I need you to see something. I didn't tell her what it was. And to watch her at that state of her life where she was sick, to see her go, that's you. <laughs> I was like, yes, ma, that's me. That's one of the many projects I was telling you. She was like, that's on TV. I said, yes, ma'am. And that mm, is kind of like the joy you have when you perform. You don't do it to be a star. -er. 
you know, and I emphasize the R because, you know, you got big egos. Ooh, you do it because you love what you do. Yeah, so, absolutely. I didn't mean to interrupt, Bob. We're going over yes, to yes, our, yes. our commercial break. When we come back, I would like to continue this conversation. When we come back from a commercial break. The whole point of my talk show is to show you that even with having a learning disability, I can sell them out to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. Prove them. Stem out to something. Now we're back from the commercial <laughs> break. And what were you saying before the commercial break? Um, Army all the way. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I knew I like I knew I liked you, Mr. Waters, for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that energy. Yes, Ooh. yes. Ooh, wow. <laughs> so yes. It's a little bit, I mean, I I don't mind talking, but when I talk about myself, it's like I don't, don't want to miss too much. I rather have a question. And if you ask me a specific question, then I would rather answer that. But to kind of conclude what we was you were saying tell a little bit about myself and I said I'll try to make a long story short which you know long story longer it's just that I'm eclectic I love to perform I've always have at I was going to tell my age but I had to catch that <laughs> at this age in my life I still when I'm cleaning up I actually feel like I'm on stage performing to make it so real like if you were doing a certain part, if you was playing Cinderella, if you was if you was the maid, I actually still do that. So with me, performing is always going to be a part of who I am, why I am. I'm trying not to I'm trying to get that space right there, gentlemen, you know, a little vain. I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just want to inquire or try something different. Because if you stay in a comfort or a realm that you're used to and you don't push yourself, you don't even know how far you can go. I'm even taking voice lessons just in case I have to sing something and not be scared about it. Because there's a technique to singing. You know, you have to use your diaphragm. If you don't use your diaphragm, you're just doing everything from your throat and it's putting, you know, that's hurting you. So. You got to project. <laughs> exactly. Now, not everybody could be Tamala Mann, although I would love to be like her in the vocal ex extra as what is what do I want to say? Atmosphere, stratosphere. I would love to be so powerful and rounded like she is with the vocal abilities. Oh my gosh, she's good. You mentioned oh, that's talent. You mentioned you were from Brooklyn. Are you familiar with all areas of Brooklyn? No. <laughs> my mom had me and my twin brother uh, close to home. He had the top lock key. I had the bottom lock key. <laughs> so we couldn't, if you went where you wasn't supposed to, you got in trouble because the other kid was, meaning me, I was home. So, you know, mom was a single mom. So we had to be close together again, like what Mr. Water said, safety. And I find safety in performing. It's again, there's no boundaries. I when I went to the National Conservatory of Dramatic Arts in Georgetown here in um, D.C., one of my instructors, teachers, professor, whatever you want to call them, they're so talented. They say, "I rather for you to do so much and for me to talk you down than for me to have to resuscitate you or." pump life into you <laughs> and that sticks with everything i try to do you know so i, I love i love performing i do <laughs> i can relate to that because it's like most of the guests i have on my show it starts off great and it goes down like the titanic <laughs> and that's oh, a hard yeah i know there are moments voice. like that when you just want to quit and give up but trust and believe so i want to do something fun i have a lesson okay. question spot I want this to be more interactive. I want each of us to go around and tell a funny story. It can be completely outrageous. <laughs> and the reason you mentioned Brooklyn, if you want, I can send you the interview. I can do that as soon as I'm done. Okay. I went to Manhattan Neighborhood of Broadcast, and they were in Manhattan. Uh, obviously, they were in Manhattan. <laughs> it's called Manhattan Neighborhood of Broadcast, and it's like public access 
like PBS kind of, but mm-hmm. it's for people in Brooklyn who want to go and have had their own studio. It's, it's really nice. During okay. the interview, I was like, well, you know, I came up with like, I want to go to Brooklyn. I'm in Manhattan. I want to go to Brooklyn and taxi drivers. Like, oh, it's an extra $50. Well, if yeah. I can get interviewed, I want to go. I'm not really sure what the name of the street was, but my dad said, you lucky you did not get your ass shot, mugged, or killed uh, because it was like, it's. I'm going to uh, spell it out, and it's not a curse. It's like F-U-N something street, and it's um, Bronx Net. Do you ever hear of the Bronx Net in Brooklyn? In, uh, Brooklyn? Brooklyn Net? It's a, It's public access where you can go to a studio and you, you can take classes. Oh my goodness. Well, See, now it, you said I'll be telling my age. It's been, <laughs> been that long. Oh. See, what had happened was when I joined the military, <laughs> I was in New York and I flew out from New York and I was in Fort Jackson. I was there, did my MOS and my AIT there. And I, I pretty much stayed in the military. And it was like a shock, culture shock. I mean, the stuff you see on in the movies, you know, they get some of the truth from the real realism of what it is to be in war. I mean, I was in war. So some of that is erased. And when I do go home, I'm like, uh, is this where this used to be? It, it's like I... Some parts of it is gone. So please forgive me. Now, I wish I knew what you was talking about. But what came to mind in Brooklyn, it was a place called BAM. It's like Brooklyn Academy of Music. It's a pl- it was a school, I believe. Please do not quote me on this. And then there's another place. See, right now it's in pieces. Had I had these questions that you're asking earlier, I would have did my research and said, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Because even the um, restaurant that Jay-Z has, I've never been. I saw the construction of it, and I saw the construction of the football. Of fo- is it a football team, football field that they did? But I have not been back there since. So I, I do apologize. I don't know that area or what you're referencing. Jakari, yeah, I got a question. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jakari, were you in Fort Jackson in 2003? Uh, no, no, I was there in. Ooh. 9-11 happened in 01, right? Yes. Um, so you, Yeah, that, that might that might that might have been, yeah, well, that's close. The reason why I asked that question, I went down to train the whole battalion down to Fort Jackson. You know, <laughs> hand to hand combat. Oh. So that's why I was I, wondering. I don't remember that. Yeah, because my hand son was hand. stationed there. Uh, Nick Waters, Nicholas Waters, he was stationed there at Fort Jackson for years. And I went down to 2003 to train his (laughs) battalion. (laughs) Well, I was in the 352 Civil Affairs Command. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just, had had, had you been there, if when I told you that, had you been there, you'd have been saying, I remember this guy come down there, but if you you weren't there, then (laughs) that's no problem. It was close. You guys bring up a good point, and I do want to ask this question now that you brought it up. Do you guys remember where you you were and what you were doing on September 11th? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fred, we're going to start off with you. I was working. I worked for Yellow Freight. That's where I retired from out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I was working on the dock at that time. And and, uh, the guys, the jockeys pulled up with the jockey wagons to pull a trailer and they were telling guys that hey, not a uh, uh, plane's crashing into the uh, uh, the towers up there in uh, New York. Twin and, towers. Yeah, the twin towers. So when they told me that, everybody started getting excited. So then I wanted to get back to Harrisburg because my daughter was in was she in elementary school at the time? Mm. Yeah, she was in elementary. I they let us off work. I made it from Lancaster to Harrisburg. I I bet you I made it like almost fifteen to twenty minutes. I dropped a hammer because I'm a I'm, I'm, <laughs> like I said I'm a professional truck driver, but I was working on the dock because I wanted to work daylight, you know, to be home every day. So I was working the dock for a little bit. I went and picked my daughter up from school, 
And I was, in my mind, I was thinking that the military is going to call me to train people because that's mm-hmm. what we, you know, but then we wind up training people out at the Indian town gap anyway. But I kept saying, Oh, the military going to call me. They're going to call me. I'm going to be out there, oh, oh, you know, teaching people all this stuff. But that's where I was at. I was working at nine, uh, working from six in the morning to was I working from six to two. I think it was, I'll never forget that day. And everything was quiet that day. It, 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 that was a weird day. It was a weird day. Didn't see no cops on the road either. No, everything's shut down. Yeah. On that day, I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. I was about 14 years old when, and actually, no, I was 13 years years old when it happened. That's a <laughs> way, <yeah>. scary. <laughs> mm. What about you, Rick? Where were you? Uh, when 9 11 happens, I was working at the Navy Yard, Washington Navy Yard. So when the planes hit the Pentagon, in the Washington Navy Yard, which is another military base, it was all chaotic trying to get out of there because we thought, well, at least I thought that there was going to be planes and bombs hitting all the military bases and, mm-hmm. and the proximity of the Pentagon and Navy Yard. I just knew that by the time I get home, I was going to get somehow, you know, like you see in the movies, you're trying to get yes. from B, but but A to B, the bridge is out or something is out. Something yeah. you can get past. That's all I was thinking, trying to get home. At the same time, when I was like, where I live was like maybe four miles from the Pentagon. And I was saying, well, fuck just getting to home. I got to get to North Carolina where my mommy is. And I was like, how in the hell am I going to get to from Maryland through to North Carolina? And I got to go past the Pentagon. I mean, all mm-hmm. this stuff going through my mind. It's like, Every every war movie, every horror movie, every space movie, every yeah. disaster movie you could think of was coming through your mind. Every scenario, it was like mind boggling. It's like, and DC has a notorious traffic jam. Can you imagine <laughs> trying to get out of DC or get anywhere in DC on a normal day? Is chaotic. Just imagine when this shit going on. You, it's a parking lot every block. There's a, a, a local <laughs> parking lot. But I finally got home and it was just like you say, it was a chaotic, unusual day that is gonna live in infamy for me anyway. Well, I do want to talk to you guys off the air. We have three minutes left, but I do want to hear from a beautiful guest where you were wrapping up. But I do oh. want to do a <laughs> army episode with you guys if you're interested in that. No, wrapping up the key fans network. If you're watching on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Instagram, and all social medias. Make sure to like and subscribe. This is a brand new season. This is the last episode of 999. This was episode for season 10. Our next episode will be season 11. Brand new special effects, brand new guests, and brand new everything. Until we meet again, thank you. Catch you later. Thank you for enjoying today's episode.